Section seven of The Rider on the White Horse by Theodor Storm. Translated by Margarete Münsterberg. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Avaii in October 2013. At the time when the horse market was going on, Hauke Haien had ridden into the city, although he had had nothing to do with the market. Nevertheless, when he came home toward evening, he brought home a second horse. It had rough hair, however, and was lean so that one could count every rib, and its eyes looked tired and sunken deep into the sockets. Elke had stepped out in front of the house door to meet her husband. Heaven help us! she cried. What shall we do with that old white horse? For when Hauke had ridden up to the house with it and stopped under the ash tree, she had seen that the poor creature was lame too. The young dikemaster, however, jumped laughing down from his brown horse. Never mind, Elke, it didn't cost much anyway. The clever woman replied, You know, the greatest bargain turns out to be the most expensive. But not always, Elke. This animal is at most four years old. Look at it more carefully. It is starved and has been abused. Our oats shall do it good. I'll take care of it myself so that they won't overfeed it. Meanwhile, the animal stood with bowed head. Its long mane hung down its neck. Elke, while her husband was calling the hired men, walked round it with curious eyes, but she shook her head. A horse like this has never yet been in our stable. When the servant boy came round the corner, he suddenly stood still with frightened eyes. Well, Carsten, called the dikemaster, what has struck you? Don't you like my white horse? Yes, oh yes, master, why not? Then take the animal into the stable. Don't feed it. I'll come myself right off. The boy took hold of the halter of the white horse carefully, and then, hastily, as if for protection, seized the bridle of the brown horse also put into his trust. Hauke then went into the room with his wife. She had warm beer ready for him, and bread and butter were there too. He had soon finished, then he got up and walked up and down the room with his wife. Let me tell you, Elke, he said while the evening glow played on the tiles of the wall, how I came to get the animal. I spent about an hour at the dikemaster general's. He has good news for me. There will be some departures here and there from my drawings, but the main thing, my outline, has been accepted, and the next days may bring the command to begin the new dike. Elke sighed involuntarily. After all she said anxiously. Yes, wife, returned Hauke. It will be hard work, but for that I think the Lord has brought us together. Our farm is in such good order now, you can take a good part of it on your own shoulders. Think ahead ten years, then we'll own quite a different property. During his first words she had pressed her husband's hand into hers as a sign of assurance, but his last words could give her no pleasure. For whom all the property, she said. You would have to take another wife then. I shall bring you no children. Tears shot into her eyes, but he drew her close into his arms. We'll leave that to the Lord, he said. But now and at that time too we are young enough to have joy for ourselves in the fruits of our labors. She looked at him a long time with her dark eyes while he held her. Forgive me, Hauke, she said. Sometimes I am a woman in despair. He bent down to her face and kissed her. You are my wife, and I am your husband, Elke, and nothing can alter that. Then she clasped her arms tightly round his neck. You are right, Hauke, and what comes will come for us both. Then she freed him, blushing. You wanted to tell me about the white horse, she said in a low voice. So I did, Elke. I told you, my head and heart were full of joy over the good news that the dikemaster general had given me. So I was riding back again out of the city, when on the dam behind the harbour I met a shabby fellow. I couldn't tell if he was a vagabond, a tinker, or what. 
This fellow was pulling the white horse after him by the halter, but the animal raised his head and looked at me with dull eyes. It seemed to me as if he wanted to beg me for something, and, indeed, at that moment I was rich enough. "'Hello, good sir,' I hailed him. "'Where do you want to go with your jade?' The fellow stopped, and the white horse, too. "'Sell him,' he said, and nodded to me slyly. "'But spare me,' I called cheerfully. "'I think I shall,' he said. "'It's a good horse, and worth no less than a hundred dollars.' I laughed into his face. "'Well,' he said, "'don't laugh so hard. You don't need to pay it. But I have no use for it. It'll perish with me. With you it would soon look different.' Then I jumped down from my brown horse and looked into the white horse's mouth and saw that it was still a young animal. "'How much do you want for it?' I cried, for again the horse seemed to look at me beseechingly. "'Sir, take it for thirty dollars,' said the fellow, "'and I'll give you the halter to the bargain.' And then, wife, I took the fellow's stretched-out brown hand, which looked almost like a claw, and so we have the white horse and, I think, a good enough bargain. The only strange thing was that, when I rode away with the horses, I soon heard laughter behind me, and when I turned round my head, saw the Slovak standing with his legs apart, his arms on his back, and laughing after me like a devil. "'Oh, horror!' cried Elke. "'I hope that white horse will bring you nothing from his old master. May he thrive for your good, Hauke.' "'Thrive he shall, at least as far as I can make him.' and the dikemaster went into the stable, as he had told the boy a while ago. But not only on the first night did he feed the white horse. From that time on he always did it himself, and did not leave the animal out of sight. He wanted to show that he had made a first-rate bargain. Anyway, he did not want to allow any mistake. And already after a few weeks the animal's condition improved, Gradually the rough hair vanished, a smooth blue-spotted skin appeared, and one day when he led it round on the place it walked nimbly on its steady legs. Hauke thought of the adventurous seller. That fellow was a fool, or a knave who had stolen it, he murmured to himself. Then, soon, when the horse merely heard his footsteps, it threw back its head and neighed to greet him, and now he saw, too, that it had, what the Arabs demand of a good horse, a spare face out of which two fiery brown eyes were gleaming. He would lead it into its stable and put a light saddle on it, and scarcely did he sit on the saddle when the animal uttered a neigh like a shout of delight. It sped away with him, down the hill to the road and then to the dike, but the rider sat securely, and when they had reached the top it went more quietly, easily, as if dancing, and thrust its head to the side of the sea. He patted and stroked its smooth neck, but it no longer needed these endearments. The horse seemed altogether to be one with the rider, and after he had ridden a distance northwards out on the dike, he turned it easily and reached the farm again. The men stood at the foot of the hill and waited for the return of their master. "'Now, yawn he cried as he leaped down from his horse. "'You ride it to the fence where the others are. It'll carry you like a cradle.' The white horse shook its head and neighed loud over the sunny marshes, while the hired man was taking off the saddle, and the boy ran with it to the harness-room. Then it laid its head on its master's shoulder and suffered him to caress it. But when the hired man wanted to swing himself on its back, it leaped to the side with a sudden bound and then stood motionless, turning its beautiful eyes on its master. "'Hallo, Ivan!' cried Hauke. "'Has he hurt you?' And he tried to help his man up from the ground. The latter was busily rubbing his hip. "'No, sir, I can manage still, but let the devil ride that white horse.' "'And me!' Hauke added, laughing. Then bring him to the fence by the bridle. And when the man obeyed, somewhat humiliated, the white horse meekly let itself be led. A few evenings later the man and the boy stood together in front of the stable door. The sunset gleam had vanished behind the dike, the land it enclosed was already wrapped in twilight, 
Only at rare intervals from far off one could hear the lowing of a startling bull or the scream of a lark whose life was ending through the assault of a weasel or a water rat. The man was leaning against the doorpost and smoking his short pipe, from which he could no longer see the smoke. He and the boy had not yet talked together. Something weighed on the boy's soul, however, but he did not know how to begin with the silent man. Even, he said finally, you know that horse skeleton on Yeva's sand? What about it? asked the man. Yes, even, what about it? It isn't there any more, neither by day nor by moonlight. I've run up to the dike about twenty times. The old bones have tumbled to pieces, I suppose, said Ivan, and calmly smoked on. But I was out there by moonlight, too. Nothing is moving over there on Yeva's sand, either. Why, yes, said the man. If the bones have fallen apart, it won't be able to get up any more. Don't choke, Ivan. I know now, I can tell you where it is. The man turned to him suddenly. Well, where is it then? Where? repeated the boy. It is standing in our stable. There it has been standing ever since it was no more on the island. It isn't for nothing that our master always feeds it himself. I know about it, even. For a while the man puffed away violently into the night. You're not right in your mind, Carsten, he said then. Our white horse? If ever a horse was alive, that one is. How can a wide-awake youngster like you get mixed up with such an old wife's belief? But the boy could not be converted. If the devil was inside the white horse, why shouldn't it be alive? On the contrary, it was all the worse. He started, frightened, every time that he stepped into the stable toward night, where the creature was sometimes kept in summer, and it turned its fiery head toward him so violently. "'The devil take you!' he would mutter. "'We won't stay together much longer.' So he secretly looked round for a new place, gave notice, and, about All Saints' Day, went to Ole Peters as hired man. Here he found attentive listeners for his story of the dikemaster's devil's horse. Fat Mrs. Folina and her dull-witted father, the former dike overseer, Yes Harders, listened in smug horror, and afterwards told it to all who had a grudge against the dikemaster in their hearts, or who took pleasure in that kind of thing. In the meantime, already at the end of March, the order to begin on the new dike had arrived from the dikemaster general. Hauke first called the dike overseers together, and in the inn up by the church they had all appeared one day and listened, while he read to them the main points from the documents that had been drawn up so far, points from his petition from the report of the dike master general, and lastly the final order in which, above all, the outline which he had proposed was accepted, so that the new dike should not be steep like the old ones, but slant gradually toward the sea but they did not listen with cheerful or even satisfied faces. "'Well, yes,' said an old dike overseer. "'Here we have the whole business now, and protests won't do any good because the dike master general patronizes our dike master.' "'You're right, Detlef Wiens,' added a second. "'Our spring work is waiting, and now a dike miles long is to be made.' then everything will have to be left undone. You can finish all that this year, said Hauke. Things don't move as fast as that. Few wanted to admit that. But your profile, said a third, bringing up something new. The dike will be as broad on the outside toward the water as the other things are long. Where shall we get the material? When shall the work be done? If not this year, then next year. That will depend chiefly on ourselves, said Hauke. Angry laughter passed along the whole company. But what is all that useless labor for? The dike isn't supposed to be any bigger than the old one, cried a new voice. And I'm sure that stood for over thirty years. You are right, said Hauke. Thirty years ago the old dike broke, then backwards thirty-five years ago and again forty-five years ago, 
but since then although it is still standing steep and senseless the highest floods have spared us but the new dike is to stand in spite of such floods for hundreds of years for it will not be broken through because the gentle slope toward the sea gives the waves no point of attack and so you will gain safe land for yourselves and your children and that is why the government and the dike master general support me and besides that is what you ought to be aware of for your own profit when the assembled were not ready on the spot to answer these words an old white-haired man rose with difficulty from his chair it was elke's godfather jewe manners who in response to hauke's beseeching had kept his office as dike overseer dike master hauke Hayen, he said you give us much commotion and expense and i wish you had waited with all this until the lord had called me to rest but you are right and only unreason can deny that we ought to thank god every day that he has kept us our precious piece of foreland against storms and the force of the tide in spite of our idleness now i believe is the eleventh hour in which we must lend a hand and try to save it for ourselves to the best of our knowledge and powers and not defy god's patience any longer i my friends am an old man i have seen dikes built and broken but the dike that hauke Hayen has proposed according to his god-given insight and has carried through with the government that dike none of you living men will see broken and if you don't want to thank him yourselves your grandchildren some day will not deny him his laurel wreath Yeve manners sat down again he took his blue handkerchief from his pocket and wiped a few drops from his forehead the old man was still known as a man of efficiency and irreproachable integrity and as the assembly was not inclined to agree with him it remained silent but hauke Hayen took the floor though all saw that he had grown pale i thank you jewe manners he said for staying here and for what you have said you other gentlemen have the goodness at least to consider the building of the new dike which indeed will be my burden as something that cannot be helped any more and let us decide accordingly what needs to be done speak said one of the overseers and hauke spread the map of the new dike out on the table a while ago someone has asked he began from where we shall get the soil you see as far as the foreland stretches out into the flooded district a strip of land is left free outside of the dike line from this we can take our soil and from the foreland which runs north and south along the dike from the new enclosed land if we have a good layer of clay at the water side at the inside and the middle we can take sand now first we have to get a surveyor to mark off the line of the new dike on the foreland the one who helped me work out my plan will be best suited for the work furthermore we have to order some one-horse tip carts at a cartwright's for the purpose of getting our clay and other material for damming the channel and also for the inside where we may have to use sand we shall need i cannot tell now how many cartloads of straw for the dike perhaps more than can be spared in the marshes let us discuss then now how all this is to be acquired and arranged the new lock here too on the west side toward the water will have to be given over to an efficient carpenter later for repairs the assembly gathered round the table looked at the map with half attention and gradually began to talk but it seemed as if they did it merely so that there might be some talking when it came to the choice of a surveyor one of the younger ones remarked you have thought it out dike master you must know best yourself who is fit for it but hauke replied as you are sworn men you have to speak your own opinion jacob mayen and if you think of something better i'll let my proposal fall oh i guess it'll be all right said jacob mayen but one of the older ones did not think that it would be so perfectly all right he had a nephew a surveyor the like of whom had never been made in the marshes who was said to surpass the dike master's father the late Tedehayen. so there was a discussion about the two surveyors and it was finally decided to let both do the work together 
There was similar disputing over the carts, the furnishing of the straw and everything else, and Hauke came home late and almost exhausted on his brown horse, which he was still riding at that time. But when he sat in the old armchair, handed down from his self-important but more easy-going predecessor, his wife was quickly at his side. "'You look tired, Hauke,' she said, and with her slender hand pushed his hair out of his forehead. "'A little, I suppose,' he replied. "'And is it getting on?' "'It'll get on,' he said with a bitter smile. "'But I myself have to push the wheels "'and have to be glad if they aren't kept back.' "'But not by all.' "'No, Elke, your godfather, Jewe Manners, is a good man. "'I wish he were thirty years younger.' "'When, after a few weeks, the dike line had been marked off "'and most of the carts had been furnished, "'the dikemaster had gathered together in the inn by the church "'all the shareholders of the land to be diked in, "'and also the owners of the land behind the old dike. "'He wanted to present to them a plan for the distribution of the work "'and the cost, and to hear their possible objections, "'for the owners of the old land had to bear their part of the labour and the cost "'because the new dike and the new slices would lessen the running expenses of the older ones. "'This plan had been a hard piece of work for Hauke, "'and if he had not been given a dike messenger and a dike clerk "'through the meditation of the dike master general, "'he could not have accomplished it so soon, "'although again he was working well into the night.' When he went to bed, tired to death, his wife no longer waited for him with faint sleep. She, too, had such a full share of daily work that she lay, as if at the bottom of a deep well, in a sleep that could not be disturbed. Now Hauke read his plan and again spread his papers out on the table, papers which, to be sure, had already lain for three days in the inn for inspection. Some serious men were present who regarded this conscientious diligence with awe, and who, after quiet consideration, submitted to the low charge of the dikemaster. But others, whose share in the new land had been sold either by themselves or their fathers, or someone else who had bought them, complained because they had to pay part of the expenses of the new diked-in land which no longer concerned them, not thinking that through the new work the old land would be less costly to keep up. Again there were others who were blessed with shares for the new land, who clamoured that one should buy these off them for very little, because they wanted to be rid of shares that burdened them with such unreasonable labour. Ole Peters, who was leaning against the doorpost with a grim face, shouted into the midst, "'Think first and then trust in our dikemaster. He knows how to calculate, he already had most of the shares, then he was clever enough to get mine at a bargain, and when he had them he decided to dike in the new land. After these words for a moment a deadly silence fell upon the assembly. The dikemaster stood by the table where he had spread out his papers before. He raised his head and looked over to Ole Peters. You know very well, Ole Peters, he said, that you are libeling me. You are doing it just the same because you know that, nevertheless, a good part of the dirt you are throwing at me will cling to me. The truth is that you wanted to be rid of your shares, and that at that time I needed them for my sheep raising. And if you want to know more, I will tell you that the dirty words which escaped your lips here at the inn, namely that I was made dikemaster only on account of my wife, that they have stirred me up, and I wanted to show you all that I could be dikemaster on my own account. And so, Ole Peters, I have done what the dikemaster before me ought to have done. If you are angry, though, because at that time your shares were made mine, you hear now there are enough who want to sell theirs cheaply, because the work connected with them is too much. There was applause from a small part of the assembled men, and old Jewe Manners, who stood among them, cried aloud, Bravo, Hauke Haien, the Lord will let your work succeed. But they did not finish after all, although all the Peters was silent, and the people did not disperse till supper time. Not until they had a second meeting was everything settled, and then only after Hauke had agreed to furnish four teams in the next month, instead of the three that were his share. 
At last, when the Whitsuntide bells were ringing through the land, the work had begun. Unceasingly the dump carts were driven from the foreland to the dike line, there to dump the clay, and in the same way an equal number was driven back to get new clay from the foreland. At the line of the dike itself, men stood with shovels and spades in order to put the dumped clay into its right place and to smooth it. Huge loads of straw were driven up and taken down. The straw was not only used to cover the lighter material, like sand and loose earth, which was used for the inside, gradually single pieces of the dike were finished, and the sod with which they were covered was in places securely overlaid with straw as a protection against the gnawing waves. Inspectors engaged for the purpose walked back and forth, and when it was stormy they stood with wide open mouths and shouted their orders through wind and storm. In and out among them rode the dikemaster on his white horse, which he now used exclusively, and the animal flew back and forth with its rider, while he gave his orders quickly and dryly, praised the workman, or, as it happened sometimes, dismissed the lazy or clumsy man without mercy. "'That can't be helped,' he would cry. "'We can't have the dike spoiled on account of your laziness.' From far, when he came up from the enclosed land below, they heard the snorting of his horse, and all hands went to work more briskly. Come on, get to work, there's the rider on the white horse. During breakfast time, when the workmen sat together in masses on the ground with their morning bread, Hauke rode along the deserted works, and his eyes were sharp to spy where slovenly hands had used the spade. Then, when he rode up to the men and explained to them how the work ought to be done, they would look up at him and keep on chewing their bread patiently, but he never heard a word of assent or even any remark. Once at this time of day, though rather late, when he had found the work on a part of the dike particularly well done, he rode to the nearest assembly of breakfasting men, jumped down from his white horse, and asked cheerfully who had done such a neat day's work. But they only looked at him shyly and somberly, and only slowly, as if against their will, a few names were given. The man to whom he had given his horse, which stood as meekly as a lamb, held it with both hands, and looked as if he were frightened at the animal's beautiful eyes, fixed, as usual, upon its master. "'Well, Martin,' Hauke called to him, "'why do you stand there as if you had been thunderstruck?' "'Sir, your horse is so calm as if it were planning something bad.' Hauke laughed and took the horse by the reins himself, when immediately it rubbed its head caressingly against his shoulder. Some of the workmen looked shyly at horse and rider, others ate their morning meal silently, as if all this were no concern of theirs, and now and then threw a crumb to the gulls who had remembered this feeding place, and with their slender wings almost descended on the heads of the men. For a while the dikemaster gazed absently at the begging birds as they chased with their bills the bits thrown at them, then he leaped to his saddle and rode away, without turning round to look at the men. Some of the words that now were being spoken among them sounded to him like derision. "'What can that mean?' he spoke to himself. Was Elke right when she said that all were against me? These laborers and poorer people, too, many of whom will be well off through my new dike. He spurred on his horse, which flew down into the enclosed land as if it were mad. To be sure, he himself knew nothing of the uncanny glamour with which the rider of the white horse had been clothed by his former servant boy, but now the people should have seen him, with his eyes staring out of his haggard face, his coat fluttering on his fiery white horse. End of section 7